Yes, we better. We don't have much time, so we need to start on time. And we've got a very distinguished guest who I should also say is a very, very old friend, not just of myself personally, I'm gratified to say, but of many, many people who see San Diego. So Jeremy Wallace, welcome back. I hope it feels like a homecoming to you. It certainly feels like a homecoming to us. Welcome to this public lecture uh, hosted by the 21st Century China Center here at UC San Diego. Uh, and this is one of a series of lectures, of course, the 21st Century China puts on. Uh, I'm Barry Nonkin. I'm the So Kwan Love Professor of Chinese International Affairs here at the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We're very happy to welcome Professor Wallace, who is Professor of Government at Cornell University, and I believe just promoted to full professor at Cornell University. So congratulations, Jeremy. Uh, he's also director of Cornell's East Asia program. He studies authoritarian authoritarian politics, but also urbanization, information, data, and of course, China. Jeremy has just published a book, starting to make some waves, got some uh, spin-off publications, if we can call them that, in foreign policy and foreign affairs. Um, he's also, I didn't know this, this is in my little sheet sheet, Jeremy is one of the editors at Monkey Cage and also writes the China Lab newsletter. So Jeremy's been real, real busy. Before we start, a little bit of quick housekeeping. It's a, this is a dual mode, so we're on Zoom and the lecture is being recorded. We will have time for questions after the presentation. We'll have a Q&A period. So please, if you're online listening, use the question and answer box uh, at the bottom of your screen and we'll be curating your questions and feeding them to the author. Congratulations on your new book, Jeremy. The floor is yours. Thank you. So okay. Um, thank you. Um, that was a very kind introduction. Uh, the first time I've been introduced without as a professor without that associate uh, label in front. So that's um, that's very gratifying. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, here to talk a little bit about um, Seeking Truth and Hiding Facts, which is a book I just published. Um, available in bookstores everywhere. The Kindle version is still only $9.99 if you um, don't yet have a copy and don't like to have physical objects. Um, Kindle, Kindles are great. Um, so the title is a, is a play on a classical Chinese expression, uh, seek truth from facts, a phrase that Mao had famously used or had used, but the Deng then took to use uh, Mao to fight against Maoism. Um, that's so seek truth from facts. Hiding facts uh, is because in pursuit of rapid development, many facts were hidden. Um, so the, the kind of like to get the bottom line up front, um, so how did a revolutionary communist party come to justify itself through GDP statistics and why is it shifting away from doing so? Although I will note um, in 2023, I don't know maybe if I would necessarily argue if they are shifting away from doing so as much as, um, as they were when I uh, finished the book. Um, the books have to be finished and so we can't, um, can't just always uh, keep on playing with it. Um, so, and it's not just kind of the phrases and the, the kind of justification strategy, but the, their underlying practices that were changing as well. A real reorientation of personalization of power, lines of authority, monitoring and development strategies. So that's the underlying question, the kind of like one sentence answer. Um, so again, you should buy the book, but if you don't want to, this one sentence will get you a lot of the way. A few numbers came to define Chinese politics until they did not count what mattered and what they counted did not measure up. Um, and there's a little bit there that, um, so what I mean here is that a few numbers came to define Chinese politics. Most notably is this kind of GDP number, which we'll talk more about. Um, but I think kind of more interestingly, like the center transformed an ideological movement um, into a pragmatic growth promoting machine. Um, and, but this idea of uh, kind of like what they, uh, the kind of it was very successful until it did not count what mattered. Um, 
if you can't, GDP is great until you can't go outside because the pollution is so bad and the air quality uh, makes it so you, your children suffer. Um, but it doesn't matter if corruption is so bad um, that you, like there's no actual kind of sharing with the people, um, what have you. And what they counted did not measure up. I mean this in two ways. One is that the numbers themselves are falsified. This is how I got into the project it was about GDP falsification and the ways in which we can trust or not trust Chinese data. Um, but then also this other idea that if you're in the business of being justified by growth and growth is no longer what it was, how do you, how does that affect justification? How does that affect um, kind of legitimacy or the kind of like sense in which things are going forward? So that's kind of this, the argument is about the ways in which the Chinese government kind of a, use quantified politics, a few numbers to really justify and define Chinese politics, which was a very successful development strategy core to the regime strategy, but then eventually kind of did not count what mattered and did not measure up. Um, and so what, what, what has replaced it or what has come to replace it um, is what I refer to as a neopolitical turn under Xi Jinping in particular, um, which I think of as both a fix and a hedge to the problems of this prior system. Um, so it's a fix in the sense that if corruption, if you believe that corruption is slowing down growth, perhaps anti-corruption uh, can fix growth issues, right? If instead of somebody's brother getting the business development who has no talent and you instead can kind of fix that so that talented corporations or talented individuals can, can get assets and develop them, maybe growth can be fixed. Um, similarly, improving governance might fix concerns about uh, regarding living standards, but it's also a hedge. Um, you don't want to be in the business of justifying yourself on output terms if you think that the output numbers are likely to decline. And so shifting away from justification based on output towards um, things that are more uh, kind of amenable to, to the regime, kind of strength or what have you, uh, might be better, clean governance. Um, and so in the interests of, we have, as Barry said, we have, a, we have a short time and I have a little bit of a uh, getting over a little bit of a cold, so I might run out of voice anyway. So I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about the first chapter and then the sixth chapter um, of the book. Um, the kind of the first chapter just introduces the arguments. The second chapter thinks about kind of like what quantification means for authoritarian politics broadly. And I'm happy to talk about that. Um, the third chapter kind of third for uh, the third chapter kind of introduces the ideas and the origins of kind of this system of what I refer to as limited vision, uh, limited quantified vision, and the ways in which this limited vision was kind of part of the response to the, the cat catastrophes of the Cultural Revolution. Chapter four is the aftershocks about that initial kind of reform decision, the ways in which that kind of moved um, forward. Chapter five is about what worked. Chapter six is about what didn't work. It's always more interesting to tell the kind of like troubling stories than the kind of like boring successful stories. Like no one wants to hear those, right? Um, Chapter seven um, is about the neopolitical turn under Xi um, that you're at this point, we're all very familiar with. And chapter eight kind of concludes the book. Um, but as I alluded to at the beginning, I think actually the current moment is a very fascinating one for me, thinking that someone who's thought about these issues, but I think for everyone thinking about Chinese politics these days, a lot has changed in the past um, eight to 10 weeks. And I'd love to have a conversation with you about it. Um, so, um, so Wen Jiabao, and two, this is in uh, 2013, the outgoing premier um, uh, delivered his final government work report before an audience of thousands of National People's, uh, National People's Congress deputies. He continued at length, and if those of you who have watched these speeches know, uh, at least they used to before she kind of like, there would always be kind of like the pictures of people falling asleep, the deputies falling asleep. Um, he continued at length explicating the administration's successes, laying out lots of kind of what they actually had done in very quantified terms. This is, these are all kind of issues, part of the stimulus package um, that had been kind of in response to the global financial crisis. Um, at no point did he mention any individuals, neither elite politicians nor citizens until his final sentence, which included a reference to the leadership of the party central committee with comrade Xi Jinping as general secretary. So this kind of this kind of narrative of everything that the Chinese Communist Party has done to promote development um, is the kind of like part and parcel to, to Chinese politics. But just six months later, Xi in, in Hebei is doing a very different thing. Um, he visited and the contrast could hardly have been greater. In those intervening months, local party and state officials have been on the receiving end of thousands of criticisms 
um, public comments. Um, the litany of personal failings and mistakes served as the basis for dozens of self-criticisms. So the officials themselves then had to, to prostrate themselves. Um, and so in two days over four marathon democratic life meetings, officials on the verge of tears um, admitted their failings. SCMP loves its dramatic headlines. So sweating on the verge of tears is an SCMP. I don't, I didn't really verify tears um, by kind of watching the videos, but it did, it did seem stressful. Um, for these apologia were not kept in private within back rooms where party state elite made decisions. Instead, they were broadcast um, for all to see. And one particular self-criticism I thought was really interesting. So um, Joe Bunshun said, I cared very much as the party secretary. I cared very much about development speed and economic volumes, but not as much about the people's interests. And for someone like myself, who had been kind of following Chinese politics, for someone to care too much about economic volumes, too much about kind of GDP, it felt um, kind of like a bit shocking after dozens um, kind of years of statements like when Joe Bao had offered just a short time before. The public relations job of Chinese officials seemed to mostly entail standing in front of audiences of party members and talk about rapid growth in these economic volumes. Um, they were the principal face of Chinese politics to the citizenry, investors, and the outside world. An explicit attack on the quantitative metrics of performance that dominated the discourse, especially in the context of open emotional displays of conflict within the party state, uh, points to serious changes in Chinese politics. And these broadcasts were but one of a series of similar public presentations. Um, and it wasn't just kind of this what, of one moment or kind of the rhetoric. Um, you really do see a turn in discourse. So this is People's Daily's articles with GDP um, kind of over time. Um, again, in 2008, you don't want to be talking about GDP. It's not exactly a great moment. Um, but other than that, you really do see this, uh, I think, quite striking trend. Um, with the turning point right around 2012. Um, so um, this uh, here. So the book has five kind of like five takeaways, three kind of more general to authoritarian politics, two more specific to the Chinese case. Um, first, that when, when you think about authoritarian politics, the political science literature in particular is really focused on coercion and co-optation. That is repression or violence against people. That is how regimes are seen, seen to state in power or co-optation, keeping people in line with, with funds. Um, but I think we need to, I think the, the discipline is not done enough to really think about um, the ways in which um, convincing this uh, kind of the words of dictators matter as to the imagery and other symbols that they use to generate compliance from citizens and the regime itself. Um, of course, security forces willing to shoot uh, citizens um, is important, and yes, incorporating and paying off adversaries helps as well, but quite a lot of effort goes into convincing the population and the regime itself that continued rule by the regime is in its best interest. And falsification may also play a role, of course, um, but is not, not the only story. So second, um, that mass politics shapes elite politics. The political science literature is in authoritarian politics is really focused on kind of the threat to authoritarian politics is other elites. And what really kind of, if you look at the data, you look at regimes, what ousts regimes tends to not be the popular image of people in the street kind of rising up in revolution, but it's actually uh, other elites. Coups are the dominant form. Um, but what is that? But, and so because of that, the literature is focused on elite politics. That's what actually matters, it seems. And I think in doing so, it has forgotten the extent to which mass politics shapes elite politics. Um, that elites in making their decisions about offering a coup or responding kind of like follow and try to track um, their interpretation and, and sense of what is going on at the mass level. Um, and then finally that we want to think about what is a threat to the regime, we need to think about kind of the, the regime's identity, um, not is just not just Kind of who the regime is, like, is it Xi Jinping himself? Is it the set of the Politburo Standing Committee? Is it some broader set of population, the Central Committee? Um, the, um, or is it some, some different population? You need to think about who is the leadership. You need to think about how regimes rule. Um, so who is the regime? How does it rule? And then third, and I think this is the one that political science is focused less on, why is it interested in holding power? Um, we, of course, have focused on who and how, and these are kind of the more basic pieces. Um, the Geddes, I think Barbara Geddes' work in particular, separates different types of authoritarian regimes based on who the leader was, and showing their distinct politics was a major step forward. And we're washed in excellent books and articles, 
on the financial and coercive tools um, that authoritarian regimes use to stay in power. But I think work on ideology and justification has been thinner. And naked self-interest is less compelling than justifications that suggest a broader public or regime interest in the actions that are being considered. Um, so let me jump to kind of like the quantification piece. I think when we think about numbers and quantification in political science, we've usually thought about it as having this pro-democratic <clears throat> context. That is that there's something transparent about having numbers and kind of like you have numbers, we have numbers, you can judge me and hold me accountable because we have this, this technology and, uh, of, of transparent numbers. But I think the extent to which um, the quantification imparts an aura of an object of truth, transparency, and scientific authority. Um, but it also, and it does appear to aid accountability without democracy by generating commonly understood numerical benchmarks, but it also empowers the elites that create and kind of measure the metrics under evaluation. Um, and so that, that kind of last piece, I think it has more authoritarian bent than, than we have previously seen. And finally, this last phrase, limited quantified vision, is my kind of like summing up expression for the ways in which the, the Chinese regime under the reform era really kind of limited its vision to localities to just a few numbers, GDP, fiscal revenue, investment, producing excellent performance on those numbers and negative externalities elsewhere. And so that's this kind of like this overall system that I'm talking about. So the development story of China, I don't need to bore you. The, we have a lot of sentences in which that, that kind of like system, in particular, the cadre evaluation system that local government officials were judged by their um, performance. Of course, there are connections, and that is an important piece of the story too. Um, but this sense in which um, kind of performance was something that mattered um, in Chinese politics um, is, is something that uh, the, the book argues. Um, but chapter six is about kind of the ways in which this system, which produced such strong development performance also led to lots of, of problems. And the kind of the Li Keqiang quote that WikiLeaks um, published, I always have enjoyed, um, the GDP figures are man-made and therefore unreliable. Um, other figures, especially GDP six, are for reference only, he said smiling. So this idea that, which I think you can think about in kind of like this amusing ways, like, aha, we all know, the GDP data isn't real, but if you think about that kind of all the way through, if the leadership themselves acknowledge that this is a problem and they understand that this is a problem and everyone knows that this is a problem and yet it remains a problem, it's not a solvable, it's, it's, it's a deeper kind of reality that they have a hard time fixing and they try to avoid as best they can, but getting away from it doesn't seem like something that is, is simple to, to accomplish. Um, and so the local harms and hidden things, um, those of you who have spent time or kind of thought about Chinese politics over the past uh, decades are aware of a lot of these issues, the pollution issues, such as you see in the kind of like air apocalypse image behind me um, is, is quite common, local protectionism, that if your GDP is what matters or one of the things that matters for your economic performance or your, your, your political prospects, as well as your own pocketbook, um, you might be interested in kind of making sure that your own locality uh, produces uh, produces effects as opposed to kind of allowing things to be more um, open and, and free market. Similarly, this is also a story of overcapacity. Um, and you see that in the housing market in particular. Um, and the simultaneous existence of kind of slums in ghost cities is something that I'm particularly interested in given my prior work on, on urbanization. Debt issues, corruption, and falsification. So these are all kind of like generic or general problems that those of us who have kind of paid attention to Chinese politics are well aware of. The slums and ghost cities idea is particularly interesting to me, as I said, because of my work on urbanization. And this image I really enjoy. This is um, Lanzhou, the, the new area. Um, I enjoy it because it kind of, to me, shows one, you kind of see the, the kind of construction, the people living and building this kind of massive development over here. Um, and I like this image because to me, like, like these people on these kind of unicycles, I don't know, there are, I've actually seen multiple people on campus using them, but it, to me, it's always represented like a future that will never be. Like we're never gonna get around um, these, um, these kinds of things and like these units are never gonna be lived in. Um, and so, but this, but this construction was kind of like very powerful for this area, it helped GDP, probably helped individuals kind of moving forward. Um, but the, the workers themselves weren't of this locality, and so they didn't count in the numbers in the same way. And so taking care of them, incorporating them into the urban locality wasn't exactly 
um, a priority. And so they could kind of be pushed off into slum-like uh, kind of hobbles. Um, falsification is how I got into this story, uh, the kind of GDP statistics and, and so forth. And so there are lots of fun quotes. If you, especially, Zhu Ji is probably the best quote maker for any person who studies uh, Chinese politics, at least in my uh, opinion. And so this, um, if you do economic work in China, you should not too much trust in figures. Um, and there's lots of examples of these kinds of um, kind of things that look like falsification or suggest falsification. So this is industrial accident data, which kind of there was a limit that kind of provincial level officials were allowed to have deaths up to a certain point. And at that ceiling, you see this massive cutoff. So there is kind of what looks like a bell curve with kind of centered below the ceiling, but then abruptly at the ceiling, all of a sudden there's very little data suggesting that there is falsification. Um, that being said, this kind of like high pressure KPI for industrial accidents was very successful in reducing accidents. So it both achieves the end that is desired, but also produces falsification. Um, um, but the, the way I got into this project originally was with GDP data. And so this is kind of a replicating or in fact, just copying uh, the, the a table from a paper um, from BJPS um, a long time ago now, 2016. Um, called Juking the Stats from the, a quote from The Wire, a television show that no one remembers anymore. And don't recommend titling your papers with um, modern television references because people will forget about them and make it harder to find. Anyway, uh, so the idea was that, well, if there is a falsification issue, if you have, how do, if you have falsified data, how do you find patterns in that data such that you can, kind of what is the true data that you can look at to examine? And what I argue is that, that you might find some data more reliable than others, and you might find data at some moments um, have more pressure than others. And so in particular moments of political turnover, that is when one leader is coming in and one leader is going out, or the, the pressure to perform is higher. And so you might expect all else equal that the, the GDP numbers are, are higher. And what are they higher than? It's, it's kind of higher than kind of this difference between GDP growth and electricity consumption. So this kind of thing that is related, but not um, as politically manipulated or manipulable as GDP. Um, happy to talk about that data. Um, but I think more interestingly, and something that is not in um, published work yet, although Jun Yen and I have really tried, um, is uh, kind of connecting informal information flows. That this, is, this book is in many ways about kind of the formal information flows of a regime and the ways in which kind of like incentivizing officials to produce strongly given kind of this set of criteria has positive as well as deleterious effects. But what about all of those informal flows of information that exist inside of an authoritarian regime? And so that's one of the things that we look at here. Um, and so the idea is that by aligning incentives between lower and higher level officials and lowering the pressure to meet quantified targets, informal networks, actions, cliques, whatever we wanna call them, can complement a regime's formal information collection efforts and reduce falsification. So that is if your boss, if you have a strong connection to a, a higher level official, you might all else equal be less likely to falsify because you might kind of one, uh, one there's less incentive to do so because you're already likely to get promoted and there might also be kind of some negative effect on that boss. And so you don't want to uh, kind of get him in trouble as well. I say him because overwhelmingly at this level we're talking about men. Um, and so again, we have this problem of, okay, how do you measure falsification? How do you know what is true? Well, we do have increasingly some cases that have been exposed where officials have talked about um, kind of, this is what falsification, like these are areas where officially they have been designated as uh, falsified. And in those areas are falsification index, which includes not only electricity data, but also nighttime lights data and loans data. Um, kind of those exposed cities, uh, like particularly high on our falsification index, those in kind of provinces, cities that have like are in provinces where the province has been classified as having falsification, kind of medium on our list, and then other provinces are kind of below average on our list. So that's our kind of like one of the ways to validate this measure. Um, and it's, uh, it's a regression with a zoom screen on top of it, so you totally can't see. But in general, we do find this expected effect of informal ties reducing um, uh, reducing the effects of falsification or reducing a 
a falsification. You probably get rid of the yeah, black can... screen by just clicking that X. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty common. Well, yeah. still. You can move that, that yeah. bar, yeah. Okay, so so this is my Zoom. Oh, you, yeah. Like, and here's the bottom. <sighs> okay. Thank you. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, I try to use my whole slides and then it sometimes back better. Um, so we tried to control for a lot of different factors, but in the end, you still might have some questions. And I think the most compelling um, piece here um, is this idea that is it the connections themselves that are actually powerful here? And so one of the ways you can think about this is the difference between those who are not yet connected and then those who are connected. So that is these are people who are not um, like the not connected versus the connected, but these are individuals themselves who are going to be connected. So they are selecting into that group, right? They're, these are those who will be treated, but are not yet treated versus those who are actually treated. And the, the lines, if we kind of, we broke them up by year by year, they, they do cross zero, but they are, if you, if you um, kind of lump them into the different categories, they are, we do see- yeah, Sorry, Jerry, we've got a little- interrupted while you were explaining this. So the treatment here is connected to a factional member. Yes. Right. So the idea is falsification is lower if you are connected, right? Because of these aligned incentives uh, and lower pressure. And so the idea is that those who will be connected still kind of engage in falsification at or above kind of normal rates, those who are connected under. That's the, the general claim. Is it a specific faction or just High degree of connectedness. It's just connectedness with the um, official above. Like, um, I think these are city level officials, so connected to a provincial level um, leader. Got it. Oh, clarify. No. Okay. Um, so narratively, the kind of like this kind of like this system that was so successful in so many ways. Um, by 2007, when Jabao, um, from the beginning, kind of like famously argues that kind of the Chinese economy is unstable, unbalanced, uncoordinated, unsustainable. And so one of the claims that I make, similar to what Susan makes um, uh, in Overreach, is this, uh, this idea that there, there was an interest in uh, kind of impetus to move against kind of this system, this political economic system, particularly um, heavy on real estate. Um, in 2007, but the global financial crisis comes in. And so there's not an ability to kind of like, to see what would have happened under that prior regime that this political economic crisis that happens at this moment kind of leads to just doubling down on what had worked, lots of money going towards state enterprises and what have you, um, through state enterprises to um, investment economies. Um, and so the, the book kind of continues on from there into Xi Jinping, which I'm happy to talk about, but this current moment that we're living in right now, I think is really, really interesting. So the book generally argues that kind of Xi Jinping has seen the problems of this system and tried to implement some very different political kind of centralized control to reduce corruption, but also to kind of like personalize authority and um, shift away from GDP as the kind of like the, the kind of everything for the regime towards common prosperity and, and so forth. Um, and so the zero COVID um, kind of like all of the things that are happening right now. So this kind of these moments are kind of like at the end, the in particular, the 20th Party Congress that just happened um, now, now a while ago, kind of ends with this kind of consolidation of Xi Jinping and stock market decline afterwards, right? That there was uh, all these stories about everyone going to Singapore and so forth. Um, you then get a, a move suggesting that there's going to be an opening up. Um, then you actually see kind of, uh, again, kind of when actually you see some COVID numbers, you see a shutdown and again, a market crash. Then you see the, the protests happening, um, opening up at the same moment. Um, and I think to me, I wonder in, in 2023, to me, it seems like there is an attempt to, to go back to kind of move towards growth at all costs, uh, kind of not worrying about the sustainability in many ways akin to 2008, um, kind of just pumping up the real estate sector, not worrying about three red lines and all these other things that had taken place. But I'm curious what everyone else thinks about these issues as well, because I don't think um, 
I certainly don't have complete answers about these, and I'm and I'm um, really interested in in your thoughts. Um, and so, with that, kind of, I'll leave it and open questions for everyone. So, thanks. Yeah. I'm following that script here, and the script says I'm supposed to ask you a few questions. That's all right. So, <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to steal your. No, 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 not at all. Um, so let me let me be for a second. Let me be um, the GDP data, and I'm saying, wow, I feel hurt. I feel hurt. You debunked me and all, but but you you said in relation to a different set of numbers, yeah. the safety numbers. Yeah. You said. They achieve the end, but foster falsification. Mm -hmm. So I want to say, well, what about me? I'm the GDP number. <laughs> Didn't I achieve my end, but also foster falsification? How, how would you I think, respond to that? Yes, I do think the overall trend, right? So I, I skipped chapter five, which is all about the successes and the trajectory of development. But I think that over time, there became an increasing disconnect between that GDP number, which continued to rise, and people's lived experience of kind of either their consumption habits, their um, kind of like their willingness to engage in the world, what have you. And I, so I think that that the the problems that that GDP focus kind of created, particularly on corruption, um, is is increasingly problematic politically for the regime. So yes, I don't think this was not about like GDP is a bad measure, although have that discussion too. I do think that it is something that kind of was a very successful strategy that was played to the end. And there was a decision or a set of decisions that kind of suggested a move a shift away from it. But I think that shift away has been so difficult that we're actually in 2023, I think, kind of returning back in some ways to to you. So you, you you're right there. Mr. GDP, Mr. Mr. GDP. We're returning to Mr. GDP. I mean, because the counter approach would be to say that the GDP numbers were a way of taking the goal of development mm -hmm. more broadly considered and building it into the incentives at the local level, right? To make everybody commit to this development incentive. So that that's the argument I'm trying to make. I don't know if that wasn't clear. No, so that it is, it's a cut evaluation. Into 15 minutes. Yeah, I did my... Uh, yeah, so the that is the that is the core idea that this it doesn't start as GDP, right? It starts as various industrial statistics and agricultural statistics, but various quantified numbers about performance. We're not going to care if the if the cat is black or white. We're just going to kind of care if it catches mice, and we are going to kind of like we're not going to judge things um, as kind of like unacceptable politically, dogmatically. We're going to see outcome wise what works. And we're going to allow, we're, but we're also not going to demand that everyone do what we think is works. We're going to allow kind of like bottom up kind of directed improvisation if we want to use Yuan's um, term for it. Um, and we're also not going to kind of like deconstruct the entire planned economy that we had from the beginning, right? It's growing out of the like, So this um, is kind of is relatively measured. Um, but yes, the idea was that this is a way to kind of to limit attention and direct individuals towards this development goal um, in a top-down basis so that it, their incentives were to promote development. So this was not just all sneaky kind of, we're going to lie, lie, lie. This was, I think, a very successful development strategy, but like lots of hierarchical corporate or other systems that have KPIs, like eventually it gets gamed in the ways that kind of make it unsustainable. Right, right. So I mean, from the sort of incentive theory standpoint, people would say, if it can't be measured, it can't be managed. Right. And so by using GDP as the measure, it meant it could be managed. Yes. But by focusing on that measure, um, which was managed and kind of produced, you did one, you kind of led to distortions in what that data reflected in terms of reality, but also these other things that were not measured or not cared about as much became increasingly problematic. Um, and were given less attention. And when those became so important that they were what mattered politically, economically, then the attention had to be shifted. Now, if I understood correctly, you, you put some very, very interesting regressions and things on the board. Uh, they went back pretty quick. If I understood correctly, you were saying that the 
people who fell under early Xi Jinping were correlated with distortions of GDP measured by your index. Is that is that what that meant? The first regression. The, the first is the first. Yeah, can you show it? So, do you mean this early one? So this is. This is just a general. No, not that no, one. No, not that one. The later. That's your, your great that's the, Okay. Um, yeah, this one. This one. Uh, no. No. What this. So this is yes. just. Yeah. This is just. This is just saying that. This is just how do we get validity on our falsification data? So we we yes, have, exposed. So this is this is kind of like criminal cases or kind of like corruption cases of city and provincial level officials who are kind of like. And it is announced that this locality falsified its GDP data. In the early G early Xi Jinping period? Yes, I think that's when we're talking. 2013, 20, 2014, 2015, I think. I see. So I interpreted this as you saying that there was some justification behind the pattern of exposed falsification. Yes. So I, but it's not about connections necessarily as much as it is our data seems to reflect what the Chinese Communist Party and the, the People's Republic of China officially has said this is falsified data and our measure which we independently create and don't like follow like does corroborate that pattern does that make sense makes sense uh, I'm just I'm surprised that you're not connecting it more closely with Xi Jinping's anti-corruption campaign so there is um the in the article version that that Junyan, uh, this is Zhang, uh, joint work with Zhang Junyan, and in the article version we have kind of interesting kind of claims about like connections with Xi's. Uh, I'm going to misstate them because they're not in the book and I don't remember them exactly. But the extent to which um, connections with individuals of different kinds um, lead to different kind of patterns of um, uh, promotion, um, and I think. Uh, but I don't want to. I don't want to overstate the the claims there. The in the book's version is just that kind of connections lead to less falsification. All else equal, controlling for all the factors that we have in the next regression, and then that it does seem like it is the connections themselves and not something kind of like about the selection that people who are going to get connections are going to not falsify. It is. It does seem like the timing looks like it is the connection itself. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> if we're going to stay at this point, then the audience can come in. Otherwise, I'll yeah. still be Yeah, it's kind of related to this. Yeah. Um, so based on your finding, yeah. what uh, the research seems to suggest is that people who get promoted either are connected uh, so then they can tell the truth or they're liars. Hey, are you saying that the liars also gain from getting promoted? Is that part of your finding? So the way that I think about it is not necessarily that they are like that it is the lying that gets them there, but that kind of those who are successfully controlling of bureaucracies in order to play the game well um, in this way are do all else equal kind of move up the hierarchy. Why would the government want to promote a bunch of liars? So the way that I'm thinking about it is not that, that is a that is a signal about competence and controlling a bureaucracy. It is not right, right, right. right. So it's not that this is not the people that report like three hundred x, like three hundred percent of kind of their industrial value. This is people that are moving a ten percent to an eleven percent and showing that. So I think of it as thinking about sophistication in the game playing. Like I know I know how the game works. I know that my neighbors are doing this, and so I'm going to do it too. That type of thing. And so in that sense, someone who plays the game well, um, kind of if that's the way, the nature of the game, then you as a higher level official are interested in people who can navigate that in a sophisticated way. I, I Again, yes, ideally you would prefer no falsification, but that's hard to incentivize. No, but maybe not, but maybe, I mean, maybe part of the thing is to get people to falsify, to project a certain image about the regime to the world somehow. Although lying is easy, it's a costless exercise. You know, it's like if someone's like, oh, you should lie, it's like, sure, I'll lie. But I do think that there are, I mean, I do think that there is a, there are limits to lying and the extent to which you can, kind of lies in time T build onto lies and like, so the, like, 
the death announcements that we're seeing in 2023, how are they going to connect to the kind of statistics that we're going to see at the end of the year? Like, it's hard. How are these numbers going to match up? They're just not. Or so either there will be this big like <clears throat> problem in the data. They'll try to fudge everything, but I think that will lead to to lack of trust and faith in the data. And I do think that that is a real cost for a society like this one that has kind of trust issues. Holly? And, and just say procedurally, I'm gonna oh, hand sorry. out, go ahead, I'm gonna hand the baton to you. You're in charge of calling on people okay. and because we're all going so <laughs> Okay, great. <laughs> uh, this is just it's such a cool book and um, I love it. Uh, the it's like data or chance is really interesting. So um so I mean in the end this the idea of quantification is to solve the principal age problem, right? It's to make like it's to make sure that the local the localities are meeting targets. And I and then and what's interesting about your argument is like that another way to solve the principal agent problem is to through these informal networks, right? Because you can trust people, you know. Okay, so then there are two other ways to solve it, right? Right. One is um, become more democratic, mm -hmm. right? Which is kind of what's going on in this like there are all these people complaining about you, what's, you know, and then, um, you know, these sort of online complaint yeah. networks. Yep. And then the last way that I was thinking is um, like technology, right? Better surveillance, which if you can create an average falsification index that does very well, I would say, maybe this, this technology, like Ray Shui's paper on automated, like maybe we don't need this like self-recorded stuff anymore. We have better stuff. So is, so, well, I guess, so I have a few different questions. Yeah. One is why not more like using technology, more surveillance, more democracy, like type it, or, you know, not democracy, but um, input from the public, mm -hmm. right? Um, another is um, in, in the shift that you're seeing between quantification and, to informal networks. I mean, another problem with quantification is it's really transparent and that invites criticism. Is is it are we is falsification the thing that's moving them away, or is it um you know too much transparency, which is inviting criticism from I mean we see the yeah. big back trend. So anyway, that's so one of those, too many questions. So one, one of the ways to think about this, so I think they're a great question. So one of the things that quantification does internal, so um, internal to the regime is it seems relatively fair. Right. So as opposed to like, we're going to get forward because you are the most dogmatically correct. Instead, we're going to look at performance. We're going to look at outcomes. So I think at the initial period, one of the kind of like advantages um, for this quantified politics is that internally it is seen as relatively fair. And it also kind of externally in terms of both society as well as the outside world looks like we are trying to deal with you, what you society think of as the real problems. Um, and so that to me thinks like kind of seems like it is, it has a real advantage. It's not just like hierarchy, top down KPI, like that it, it does have discourse and to broader society advantages. Um, similarly, like they get to claim about technocracy and kind of like all those other kind of external, like where we look at this development story that we have. Um, the, the other pieces of what is happening that I think that you put forward about the ways to think about control and kind of guidance, especially on the technology front. I think Xi Jinping is a, I would say he's not a technocrat, but he's a technophile. Like he likes technology and believes in it. And I do think that there is a, a, a set of like kind of like, there is strong evidence that he thinks that kind of big data, whatever that may be, is going to help solve all of these problems of monitoring mm -hmm. and so forth, I think, in ways that still end up with quotas and kind of problematic things. So in the seventh chapter, I think I talked a little bit about the poverty anti-poverty campaign and the extent to which that kind of like had this big data component, but it ended up still ended up kind of like pushing people into urban apartments that they didn't want to live in because like, well, they're not rural poor anymore, are they? It was like, yes, I guess they're not technically, but is that really what they wanted? Is that better for them? Um, so I do think, and then the, I think the, the reason why do we see limits on public criticism and democratic complaint, I think like it's, it's an autocracy, then they, I think she is a control kind of aficionado and wants to control the discourse because it, transparent information and complaints from citizens can be helpful in some ways. And so I think at the beginning, you did see more of this over time. It seems like that space has been curtailed, although 
maybe in 2023 it's open and free for all on the internet and I don't know um it does seem the extent to which things are being revised not uh, the book is not being revised but the kind of where we're going I think going forward is I think a really fascinating question others yes yes <clears throat> I noted in the presentation mm -hmm. that the data that you use for the analysis mm -hmm. is kind of outdated to me Mm. The GDP is like 2000 to 2009. Mm. The comments by Dick Young is like 2007, 2002 by Ronji. Uh, do you think this thing is still happening a decade later? Mm. So this is so right. So this is the kind of description and analysis of what I think of as the prior system before Xi Jinping, right? So this is chapter six, which ends in 2012, and then what I try to do in chapter seven is talk about well. This is a political, the, the idea was I was gonna end the book there, but it took me a while and Xi Jinping really changed Chinese politics. And so I had to write more. What I wrote in that kind of like, which, which happens, um, which is also why I had to end the book because if I didn't end the book right now, I'd have to write about 2023 and that would be interesting, but terrible. Um, the, what I argue happened or kind of very simplified, I argue that in under Xi Jinping, the problems of the system falsification, but also corruption and everything else that this kind of limited vision on GDP and development had um, in the kind of like, it, there, first of all, I think there was a lot of debate about what direction, what the real problems were and what the solutions to them were. The path that Xi Jinping took was not the only possible path, that other possible paths were there but it was the path that was taken was this kind of like very controlling um, kind of personified politics, personal politics, controlling um, kind of information spaces and, um, and anti-corruption, increased monitoring, a kind of like coercion. So this is, so these are the problems that kind of convinced many that change needed to happen. And then chapter seven tries to talk about both the debates about what the shape of that change could be and then tries to detail what Xi Jinping did. So this is intent, you're right, this is dated because this is about the kind of pre-Xi period for the most part. Yes. Yeah, I get a kind of malformed question about what you can and can't falsify. And it has to do with this observation about lived experience. So, so let me just, you tell me that the Communist Party built 750 bridges last year. I mean, I've got no clue whether that's true or not. Yeah. But you tell me that there were a hundred COVID deaths yesterday, but I took my grandmother to the hospital and I couldn't get her in and she died and therefore I had to take her to the mortuary and I saw, you know, like 150 coffins or whatever sitting there, right? So I'm, I'm just, there's this other dynamic about what the public can and can't observe. It seems it has to be a part of the story and I'm just not understanding where it, Fits and what you're talking about here. Yeah. I mean, you may falsify it anyway, and but then I know you falsified it, and so I'm I'm aware I'm complicit in some game with you because I know you falsified this, and you know I know because it's observed. Yeah. So I think for I'm the not sure what the question is. Um, I think I so I, I think I understand the vibes of the question, so I think I can try to answer. Um, I think, and I think it's a reasonable one. And I don't have a great answer as to why the falsification about COVID deaths that are happening right now are happening in the way that they are. I think, um, I think in the end, like I think there is in the speech, he will say 750 bridges, and I think there is like I think there is a list, and I think that they will tell you that these exist. <laughs> but I don't know you, you as an individual don't know that. But I think that they are relatively like in, in the end, that's relatively that's at least falsifiable compared to GDP, right? Because I can't see GDP anywhere, right? In a way that a bridge. Yeah. But um, deaths, the death, the death falsification that's happening right now. So one is like, there is this manipulation of what the what is actually measured. And so the official counts are people who die by the very strict definitions of what is a COVID death um, in hospitals. And so if you're like family member dies outside of the hospital, well, you're not counted, right? So there is this, there is this technical, like this technicality. And I do think that that is part of the, the system that the, the officials can always kind of 
kind of walk, they they live and breathe this this discourse and this kind of like rules in a way that you as a citizen don't. And so you end up deferring because it's like, okay, I get like. No, but the point is, I know that that's false, right? Yeah. I know that that's false. Yeah. I think for the current moment, yeah. I think the yeah. current moment, the, the relationship is one, they want to preserve this general notion that they have succeeded on COVID and the West has failed. <laughs> and so one that that means keeping the official numbers down. And I think they're counting on kind of the distrust and fury that is kind of like in this moment to be swamped by the grief and the actual kind of suffering of people themselves as they are sick and dealing with their own family, their own traumas. And I think that that's, they're kind of just hoping that they can like just make it through this period quickly, pretend like it's already over. Like they announced, they, they kind of, so, uh, CDC said that 80% of Chinese have already gotten COVID in the past eight weeks out of nowhere. And so that that, which I think is, an, which is probably an overestimate compared to epidemiological models, but is trying to suggest that this is already done. It's in the past. We don't have to talk about it anymore. And so I think that that it's trying to move on as quickly as possible. And so, I mean, I think there are some technical reasons why, like the case count, why did they stop counting cases? Because the way that they were counting cases of COVID was by mass testing and then pooling these kind of like samples. But if everyone has, like if a lot of people have COVID, that pooling doesn't work. And so the, the whole system broke down. The death data, I, again, it's not it's not the way I would do it. Um, but I think it is just an attempt to try to, to allow the kind of like trauma and grief wave to swamp any fury or reaction um, and kind of let people individually experience that with the hope that three months later, everyone will be tired and not want to think about it. That's that's my sense about this current falsification, but I don't think this is not what I, this is not not what I would have envisioned or expected. Um, I, would have, I would have expected kind of a, a vaccination campaign kind of and have that be a quantified target and kind of really emphasize that before a measured kind of like, a kind of like opening um, piece by piece, but this kind of like just, pull the bandaid off and let it rip is is really striking. Yeah. Sorry. I wonder whether you you engage the you know sort of Jim Scott's writing about the high modernism and seeing like a state that kind of angle into your into your uh, in your analysis because listening to you made me think that maybe this is not an authoritarian politics issue is not a communist issue, is not even she is not principal agent, but it's rather a group of people who bought into this high modernist version vision about the state, and which involved sort of uniformity and you know highly distilled numbers to uh, mark the success of the of the state, which happens to be GDP. Another another number is the family planning, right? Mm -hmm. That so much so that that these numbers that may have originally started with you know a very carefully embedded kind of a set of uh, parameters, because GDP is supposed to measure economic growth, the welfare and improvement, etc. Family planning, you know, started out as a way of dealing with the real issue, let's say, mm -hmm. right? But if they morphed, just, you know, it is inevitable that this will happen into these highly repressive sort of quantification regimes and that involves falsehood and et cetera, it will leads to this, you know, catastrophic success as in, in yeah, yeah. the language that you used yeah. before. So it's, I mean, in other words, it's not really about authoritarian politics or she or the various regimes people involved. It's just this in the inexorable logic of this high modern state. So per, I think per Scott. Yeah, no, I mean I think so I, I do engage Scott a little bit. I do think that there is something there is something about hierarchies in general, right? So the fact that I started this book while like kind of going up for tenure, like is up right like there is this quantified performance right aspect to a lot of hierarchies. Um, but I think the, the book tries to kind of not just kind of say like the Chinese Communist Party is exactly like Microsoft. Um, it it tries to deal with the particularities of this place. Um, and in that sense follows Scott, like trying to think about 
And in particular, like, so for instance, the one, the one child policy, you actually had seen in the seventies, you saw a real decline in total fertility before the one child policy comes in, you see, but you also see kind of demographers being demoted during that period. And you have this set of like rocket scientists yeah. as the only authorities that, that are kind of technocratically acceptable, kind of like seeing limits of growth and other types of ideas and that they decide on this simple quantified measure. Um, that ends up being this really repressive, ends up being quite repressive. So this, even the quantification inside of the system has kind of like interesting political histories inside of it. So I don't think it's pure high modernism because I really do think that there's lots of interesting kind of like movement inside and shifts um, of kind of like, is it GDP that we care about? Is it industrial? Like, so like there's, um, under one of the issues that the Wen Jiabao administration kind of put forward is they they tried to expand the set of indicators that that officials would be kind of judged on, and but they kind of just expanded the set of indicators without really shifting the politics that significantly. They thought that shifting the indicators alone would be enough to change behavior, but they were still biased and weighted towards GDP and development, and so it didn't. It was unsuccessful. It took a broader shakeup of the overall politics. So I don't think. I think that there was attention to details and it was not just this pure kind of like um, simple story that I think Scott puts forward. Um, I do think that the it has a lot of resonances, but I do think that it's not just high modernism. Yes. Would it be fair to say that the West has been duplicitous in China's behavior? It's recently been reported mm -hmm that stock exchanges allowed Chinese companies to be listed even though they were not being audited by mm -hmm. an accredited auditor. Mm -hmm. And then China's action in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me, the, and it, it, it parallels what's going on between Russia and Ukraine, by mm -hmm. the way. It isn't the West being, it hasn't the West been complicit in it? Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think capitalist actors in all types of societies are interested in pursuing their own accumulation. And so I'm not particularly surprised that there might be some duplicitousness. I think the, um, in terms of the specifics of audits and the like exchanges, there was just a, like an, a kind of some, I, I had, I didn't follow it specifically, but there was some deal trying to kind of finally come to grips with this kind of like, um, this this loophole that seems that people that the Chinese firms seem to be able to get away without um, do lying is part of politics I think and the extent to which kind of states or others engage in um, this action I think is quite um, is part and parcel of politics and important to think about but is not also the whole of politics um, there are um, Susan had sent a message on the chat too. I don't know if I can yeah, go ahead, jump go to Susan. Um, so can we, oh, you can see it. Okay, uh, well, we're those yeah. with good vision. Um, so uh, what do you make of the COVID data during 2022, 2023? Um, and is falsification, especially by local officials, a reflection of the extreme top-down pressure to show the local officials are loyal to Xi's policy or something else? And I think here, I think there's really, interesting differences between the two periods. So as um, as I mentioned that I talked about zero COVID as again, fitting in this idea of kind of like a quantified measure that was very good at performing what it was meant to do for a long period of time, but eventually, particularly with the Omicron variant being so um, kind of virulent, it um, it became unacceptable and the, the kind of maintain maintenance of it was too costly. And so I think the the pressure to perform this quantified metric is why you saw people willing to lock down their their cities. In terms of 2023 and the opening of the ripping of the band-aid, it seems like that there was some kind of like decision that this is what was going to happen. And so people let it rip as much as possible and kind of willingness to to lie and to not report is um I don't know if it's necessarily loyal to Xi's policy, but it just seems to be the, the policy of the day. Um, and in some ways is kind of like trying to match what is happening in other societies, right? Not talking about COVID continually, even though people are dying at excess rates um, in this society and, and around the world. So I think China is trying to quickly shift 
and trying to ignore and hide this kind of like this massive wave. Hi, Barry. Hi, Jeremy. There obviously there's so many questions in the room and, and and online as well, but we have a commitment to wrap up at six, and there the clock doesn't lie. It's quantifiable. It's uh, and I also have an announcement to make, which is a week from today. Our own Micah Muscolino from the History Department is giving the Paul Pickowitz endowed lecture. It should be a special treat. So please do come. I'm not sure exactly where it will be, but I know wherever it is, I'll be there. So join me. And now join me in thanking Jeremy for a really stimulating talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.